tonight. Reaction from the LGBTQ plus community after a memo from Saskatoon's Catholic School Division suggests kids avoid the rainbow tent at Nutrients Children's Festival. Also, we catch up with the Saskatchewan co-creator of a new streaming series out this week about a 60 scoop survivor learning about her past. Plus, the riders walk through their last practice in Saskatoon before the first preseason game of the season. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It is Friday, May 26th, and the CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Good evening and thanks for watching. The Nutrien Children's Festival in Saskatoon is set to begin next week. More than a dozen activities are set up, but only one is causing a stir among parents and LGBTQ advocates. As Dean Patterson reports, that's because a Catholic school superintendent is warning parents not to bring their kids to a rainbow tent. It's not set up yet, but the rainbow tent will soon be amongst the others at the Children's Festival, though some children might be nudged away from it by teachers and parent chaperones. A recent memo from the Greater Saskatoon Catholic School Division is asking teachers and parent chaperones to keep students away from the tent. Superintendent Tom Hickey sent the email to school principals asking them to speak to teachers who may be taking students to the festival and informing them that it should not be a part of the visit. Parents are not happy about it. If you're going to tell us that you're open and inclusive and welcoming and loving, well then let's be open, inclusive and welcoming and loving. And I think that's just what has to happen. It's, it's unacceptable that in this day and age, that kind of email was sent. Organizations in support of the LGBTQ community, including Out Saskatoon, have made their own responses. In a social media post, it said superintendents, principals, teachers and parents may have influence over the children, but they cannot deny who they are. People on social media have also been lambasting the memo, while others support it. Performers and parents we caught up with just outside of the festival grounds have had their own thoughts. I believe that no one should be denied even education, because I want to become a teacher myself, and just seeing that, telling people not to go to this tent. I'll be performing at this, it just, it made me upset. This, to me, is an abomination for an organization that's supposed to be educating people, and especially with the Catholic Church, is their background, um, love and acceptance of all. And to me, it's hiding their bigotry behind a Bible. Protests are not new to events like this. In October, people held signs denouncing a drag story time held at the Wonder Hub in Saskatoon during Culture Days. In an emailed statement, the school division says Hickey's memo was not meant to be hateful or encourage exclusion. The board apologized for the deep hurt it caused, adding it welcomes members of the LGBTQ community. It also says the parents of Catholic students can decide whether they want to bring their kids to the rainbow tent at the Children's Festival, which opens on June 1st. Dane Patterson, CBC News, Saskatoon. A teacher who was injured during a school shooting in La Loche in 2016 has died. Her family says it was due to complications from her injuries. Laura Sharpaletti reports. January 22, 2016 was a living nightmare for Charlene Klein and her family. That day, a young man opened fire at the La Loche Denny High School where Klein was working as a substitute teacher. She was shot and suffered severe injuries that changed her life forever. Because I thought, it hurts to be, does it hurt to be dead? Then I realized, I'm not dead, but man, this hurts. Like my arm burnt, my chest was burning, my neck, my face, and I couldn't see. Klein was left nearly completely blind after the attack. Pellets lodged in her chest affected her heart, breathing, and her paralyzed vocal cords. 62-year-old Klein died unexpectedly in a Saskatoon hospital last Wednesday. She, uh passed away of asphy asphyxiation um, due to the vocal cords. Um, myself, my father and my brother were by her bedside at the time of her passing. Klein advocated for more help from Saskatchewan's Workers' Compensation Board. Her son says she had a difficult time getting money for surgeries and home renovations to help with her disabilities. I think the big thing is I, I really wish she didn't have to fight for everything that she got. I think that that's that's really somewhere where we're failing in this province 
uh, and with WCB. Jeffrey says he and his mother were extremely close, and he treasures her bravery and was proud of her all the way to the end. I really think I'm going to miss how, um, how resilient she was in the last seven years. Um, I think that gave a lot of strength to all of us. Jeffrey says he hopes his mother's legacy of self-advocacy changes how the WCB treats injured workers. Laura Sharpaletti, CBC News, Regina. The James Smith Cree Nation is trying to turn a corner nearly nine months after it was shaken by the deadly tragedy of Canada's worst stabbing. Sam Sampson shows us its first powwow since that horrible episode and why it's so important. <laughs> This women's traditional event is special for Samara Stonestand. It's dedicated to Bonnie Burns, a victim of the stabbings and Stonestand's godmother. It was a tough couple of months and it finally feels like real, something real. Yeah, it's something that makes you feel alive. Yeah, and back to reality. This is the first powwow in James Smith Cree Nation since what's now known as Canada's worst mass stabbing, a symbol of perseverance after the unimaginable. Early on September 4th, 32-year-old Miles Sanderson went on a stabbing rampage in his own community. RCMP say he and his brother Damien were planning something. In the days before the attack, the two were selling drugs and assaulting some residents. That morning, though, Damien became Miles' first homicide victim. He killed 10 others and brutally injured 17 more. Stone Stand says she was threatened by Miles Sanderson that day. Now she's focused on therapy, graduating high school, and her future. My plans are to become a, what is it called, um, investigator. Days like this could help with what's to come. There are two inquiries in January to look into what happened here. One into Miles Sanderson's death in police custody and the other a detailed inquiry to prevent future violence. Band officials say they've focused on working with the children in James Smith since the stabbings. The culture is going to get us through this. The language, the protocols, the rituals, the ceremonies um, will take us further than um, we can ever go. In the new school year, even more trauma-focused programs for students to help them through the stabbings and what some say caused them, addictions and intergenerational trauma. Community leaders say breaking that cycle has to start with the young. Sam Sampson, CBC News, James Smith, Cree Nation, Saskatchewan. Alberta is in the final stretch of its provincial election campaign. The vote promises to be a showdown between Premier Daniel Smith's United Conservative Party and the New Democrats under former Premier Rachel Notley. And a new poll conducted for the CBC has the UCP in the lead. Julia Wong breaks down the results. With just a couple days of campaigning left, a poll for CBC News suggests the United Conservative Party is poised to win a second mandate. Now that poll shows that province-wide there is 52% support for the UCP and 44% for the NDP. But it's in that regional breakdown where things really do get interesting. The NDP are leading in Edmonton and the UCP are far ahead in rural Alberta. But if you hone in on Calgary, it's a very different story. Now that city is the battleground for this election. And the poll shows the two main parties are stubbornly neck and neck. 49% of people in that city support the UCP, 46% support the NDP. There's 26 seats in, in Calgary and, and, and easily half of them are up for grabs right now. So, so it's, it's what it's all about. And you know, when we say it's a close election, it's not close in most of the province. It is close in those 10 ridings in Calgary. So watch everybody to be spending their weekend here trying to lock down those seats that are going to determine who forms the next government. When it comes to approval ratings for UCP leader Daniel Smith and NDP leader Rachel Notley, it doesn't appear like voters see them very differently. Province-wide, Smith and Notley have an identical 42% approval rating from voters. I think in the case of uh, the NDP, um, most people voting for NDP feel very positively towards their, their leader. Um, the UCP, it's more of a mixed bag. Some people are voting for the party and ignoring the leader. Interest in this election has been high. Advanced voting opened on Tuesday and about half a million people have already cast a ballot. Now that will wrap on Saturday and then it all comes down to election day on Monday. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. 
Saskatchewan Rough Rider fans finally get a chance to see their team in game action tomorrow night in Regina. The Riders and Lions kick things off in their preseason at 5 o'clock. The team will be without their starting QB as Trevor Harris is in Ohio, where his wife Callie gave birth to their third son, Trip. The Riders held their final walkthrough in Saskatoon this morning before hopping on the bus to Regina. Tomorrow, Jake Dolagala will start under centre against the Lions. Dolagala saw game action last year. He'll be backed up by Shea Patterson and Mason Fine. Coach Craig Dickinson says all three will get time to show their stuff. Well, we, you know, we got together as a staff a, a number of times and decided, you know, who we wanted to see. And we're, we're really going to give the quarterbacks equal reps. So, um, I think, again, I'm not sure, but I think Jake are going to start the game, and then it's just rotation after that. So, they're going to have to stay warm the entire game and uh, and do a good job of staying tuned in because it could be any one of those three at any time. Preseason games don't count in the standings, but the Riders would probably like to break a streak of 13 straight preseason games without a win. The last preseason win for the Riders came nine years ago in 2014 at the old Mosaic Stadium. Well, if there's anything a tree loves more than rain on Arbor Day, it's a hug. Do not put your umbrellas away just yet. It looks like there's more rain on the way for the weekend, or at least part of it. Ethan will be by with your forecast after the break. Stay with us. This weekend, a six-part series called Little Bird is releasing on Crave TV and APTN Lumi. As Louise Big Eagle reports, the story follows a young woman's journey to rediscover her past before she was taken during the 60 Scoop. The story follows Esther Rosenblum and her journey to find her birth family. She was taken as a child and fostered by a Jewish family. The journey brings her back to the prairies. Jennifer Podomensky is a co-creator of the drama series. She's an award-winning producer and actor from Muscapining Soto First Nation. But she was born and raised in Toronto with her father and the Jewish side of her family. She says her own experience of being Indigenous and Jewish brings authenticity to the series. I just hope that people feel the love that was put into this. And I hope that non-Indigenous people feel, feel connected to it because the stories are... Uh, relatable, but also, um, I guess, unique in the sense that nobody really knows very much about the 60s scoop. Darla Contois plays Esther Rosenblum in the series. Contois says she almost quit acting before landing the role. It was a lot of like that kind of research, just really digging deep into the character, what she was going through, who she was meeting and when. And also I had to take a Jewish crash course it wasn't like um, mandated by production or anything, but I was like, I really want to learn more about the Jewish culture since that's Esther's identity as a Jewish woman. Betty Ann Adam is a 60s scoop survivor who was taken when she was just four years old. She was raised by a white family in the Prince Albert area. She found out about her biological family when she was just 19 years old. She didn't find them until she was well into her 50s. She says the series resonates with her. You look at this film and you see this woman who's being raised in, as a, in a Jewish family and, and married in Jewish tr tradition and married to a Jewish man um, in, in the movie or in the series. And that's what happens when you're raised in a white family. Um, my, my siblings and I all ended up partnering with non-Native people. Producers of the series hope Lil Bird sheds light on the dark history and current reality of many Indigenous children and families. The six-part series premieres on May the 26th in Canada. Louise Begeagle, CBC News, Regina. This weather update is brought to you by Mercedes-Benz Regina, proud member of the Capital Automotive Group. And our weather specialist, Ethan Williams, joins me now. The humidity and the moisture is making my hair go, e -er, e -er, yeah. E -er. 
Yeah, uh, thankfully I don't seem to have the same problem. Maybe I should grow my hair out a little bit longer. And oh, then let's see that. Yeah, I've, there we go. <laughs> well, now the challenge is on, I guess. Anyway, yes, indeed, very uh, much uh, humid over these past couple of days, uh, past few days, really. And uh, with that humidity has come the moisture. And uh, this just from yesterday, uh, some heavier rainfall totals north of Regina, close to 15 millimeters near Craven, uh, Strasburg, Merrifield, Regina, and uh, just northwest of Saskatoon, picking up around kind of the five to seven and a half to eight millimeters uh, yesterday through the day. And uh, radar showing not too much moisture right now. Uh, one problem with that is that uh, the Bethune radar station just northwest of Regina has been down for the past couple of days. So it may be missing uh, a little bit of uh, some shower activity on there. But we have seen some cells pop up in southeastern Saskatchewan. And that is because we're on kind of a frontal boundary there. Still quite warm in that part of the province. Heat warnings into Manitoba, 30 degrees right now in Winnipeg. Much cooler on the backside of this system, though still in the mid-teens through much of the province. And temperatures even starting to drop off in the southwest. Getting a little bit warmer, though, in west central and kind of the northwestern regions of the province as that front moves by and some drier air in behind that. But things going to start to change again as we head overnight. High pressure keeping central and northern regions clear overnight. Tomorrow afternoon, the storm risk re-intensifies through southern Saskatchewan and we could see some severe cells through the afternoon. For central Saskatchewan, it's mostly just rain showers later on Saturday and then into Sunday, I think, is when you'll see showers. You'll probably be escaping the thunderstorm risk. The north of the province, though, you're likely done with the showers for the next while here, and this uh, being caused by a bit of an area of low pressure. So what does our threat look like for tomorrow? This is valid starting tomorrow at noon, and there are strong winds, a moderate-sized hail, heavy rain possible in the moderate risk area. There is a small area, including Weyburn Estevan, over to around uh, Assiniboia Gravelberg, where we could see one or two isolated tornadoes as well. So keep that in mind. Have a way to get weather warnings and know what to do when they come up. These uh, rainfall totals, again, vary uh, based off of what we're going to get from thunderstorms if they develop. So we can't really take these to the bank, but they're there could be a good swath of rain from southwest to northeast through a good chunk of southern and uh, central Saskatchewan over the next 24 to 48 hours. Winds a little bit breezy tomorrow. These undershooting uh, just a little bit. And then as we head through Sunday, it looks like conditions will actually be fairly calm as we head into northern Saskatchewan. Things have been this way for the past few days because we have a very stagnant area of high pressure over southern or northern Ontario rather over these uh, past few days now. But that's going to start to move out. Our pattern over Overall is going to start to change as we head through the back half of the weekend and into the beginning of next week. Not a whole big shift, but as you'll see here in our seven-day forecast in Regina, we are looking at sunnier conditions come next week and temperatures resurging. For the rider game tomorrow, of course, we'll have to watch out for some severe storms in the afternoon and again unsettled until the beginning of next week. And then that humidity sticking around, making it feel like into the 30s, including in Saskatoon, where after a couple of chances of rain here, temperatures really uh, going up. We're seeing those uh, clearing conditions. So goodbye showers. Hello summer once again, Sam. So what I'm hearing is go to the Cathedral Festival first thing tomorrow morning to avoid the severe weather. That's right. And maybe an umbrella just in case. And rain gear for the rider game. Yes. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Ethan. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> the goats are back in Wascana Centre. This week, the Provincial Capital Commission released more than 200 of these guys to nibble through invasive weeds. Each goat eats about 10 pounds of weeds each day. They came to Regina through Elbow and include a trusty guard sheepdog and two border collie herding dogs. You are welcome to go visit the goats through June 1st while they work, but you are asked to avoid the electric fences, obviously, and to keep your dogs on leashes as to not distract them. We'll be back after the break. The Canada Revenue Agency is boosting its funding for organizations that host free tax clinics. It's meant to help more Canadians with modest income file their returns. But there is also a renewed push to make filing taxes automatic. Anis Hidari reports. The federal government says it wants the Canadians who should be getting tax breaks to actually get them. But that means for a lot of Canadians, taxes have to get filed. So the government is increasing the money it pays to nonprofit clinics to help people do their taxes for free. Those clinics are often staffed by volunteers. 
you you tell them that they uh, they you are eligible for for these benefits you need to do this and that and you don't need to pay this is like a a free from uh, they are so happy in particular when they help individuals who haven't filed taxes for a number of years uh, those individuals can now finally get access to fundamental benefits and credits that they weren't getting access to before. The government has also said it wants to come up with ways to make filing taxes automatic, as in individuals wouldn't have to do it, but the federal government themselves get your taxes figured out. Researchers have said it should be possible and that more people would get the money governments have already budgeted as a result. In my opinion, the pilot program is not necessary. They can do this. Our, our research suggests that two-thirds of social assistance recipients have returns that CRA could complete today. The new grants for free tax clinics will triple the money the federal government pays to organizations that file 50 or more tax returns. As for when or if automatic tax filing becomes a reality, that's still in the works, with a pilot project expanding next year. Ani Sedari, CBC News, Calgary. Some stunning video now from South Korea showing the frightening moments in a jet when a passenger suddenly cranked open the emergency door. The jet was about 200 meters in the air at the time, just minutes from landing when the passenger sitting near it pulled open the emergency door. A howling wind blew through the cabin. Fortunately, all passengers were wearing seatbelts at the time. Nine people had to be taken to hospital. Officials say no one was seriously injured. The airline says the culprit was only able to open the door because the plane was close to landing, meaning the air pressure inside and outside was almost the same. The passenger is now in police custody. That's going to give me nightmares. Ethan is back with one last look at your weather. Let's Boy. Can we brighten that up? Well, a little bit better weather, weather for flying, at least in the morning, I think. For Regina, we'll be looking around uh, 15 degrees with a mix of some sun and cloud. But things uh, getting a little bit more unsettled as we head toward the afternoon. Some light rain by the noon hour, around 22 degrees, winds picking up. And then, of course, as we go on, there is the risk for some severe thunderstorms a little later in the afternoon. Saskatoon, a little bit sunnier, I think, tomorrow. And even though there is a chance of showers later in the afternoon for you, I think the severe thunderstorm risk is out of your hair, around 20 degrees by the noon hour. And, of course, tomorrow, the big game, well, preseason game anyway, between <laughs> the Lions and Riders. If I can step completely off screen here, there we go, looking at 22 degrees with the risk of a severe storm. Wouldn't be a Rider game without a big storm, of course, Sam. All right, thanks, Ethan. You bet. And before we leave you tonight, a big event is getting underway this weekend in Moose Jaw. The World Para Ice Hockey Championship takes place from May 28th until June 4th. Yesterday, China's team arrived in Regina and was greeted by a vibrant crowd. This is the first time they come to Canada and they bring the whole team to, into uh, Saskatchewan. And uh, as soon as they landed, they felt welcomed uh, as a family. Really, really um, pleased to see a lot of people and especially the lion. She's commenting uh, they will try their best to uh, deliver the best performance and uh, share the spirit of a uh, Paralympic to their world. Twenty games will take place at the Moose Jaw Event Center during the tournament. You can get tickets at HockeyCanada.ca. Teams from the U.S., Asia, and Europe will all be taking part. And that is it for us this week. For news anytime, you can head to cbc.ca slash sask or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Ethan will be back with more local news and weather tonight at 11. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend.